Hey everybody, how are you this evening? We are back at it with Let Go of Your Fear and we are currently in chapter three and four tonight. So we are going to start off with chapter three and it's Why is Jesus Sleeping Now? And as we start this chapter off, I feel like Gary is bringing in some really great points of a lot of what we do as parents. And when he starts to talk about some of these um, technical difficulties or struggles that he has when he was producing um, or when he was on this radio show, this radio program, um, they kind of had to fumble through it, you know, waiting for their producer to um, jump in when they really needed help. But it was that, that hands-on, like, you've got to do it. And I found in our parenting journey that that's one of those things that we um, we do a lot of the times with our children. And so we're trying to teach them something new. And so we really want to um, set the expectation to let them try it and to try to figure it out. We're, we're there. We're there to help them. We're there to catch them when they fall and do these things. But ultimately, we want them to learn how to do it themselves. And so... I think that's where a great takeaway that we're going to start to explore in this chapter and why is Jesus sleeping now? And so we, we talk about his, his humanness and his likeness to all of us that he still gets tired. He still gets hungry. He goes through all of these things. And while Jesus is the son of God, he was put here God gave us his son so he could relate to us, so he could could have this um, this human nature, this human tendency. And so as he, he gets tired, we start to explore that Jesus falls asleep because he trusts in his father and he trusts in this plan that he is laying out. You know, Jesus is recognizing what's about to happen. And so he knows that he has to, to go through this test with with the apostles. And what I also like to think of this other perspective is he's going to sleep too, because in a way there is part of that trust that he also has in the apostles ability. I mean, you have to remember they were fishermen. They had, um, ridden rough seas and, and different things. And of course we talk about this and Gary tells us that, um, the explanation of this storm is just this mega, um, thunderstorm, this, this earthquake, you know, so it's, it's on an extreme level. So unlike anything, so yes, it's going to get to the point to where it forces them to make this decision, this recognition that they need Jesus. So Jesus is falling asleep in the boat and he's entrusting that his father has this, that he's going to know how to guide his apostles when the right time comes, when they ask for his help, when they ask for him to intercede. And at the same time, he's having this, this human experience, this human reaction. Um, and there's this, uh, again, Gary talks about this childlike nature, this peacefulness that occurs with Jesus to rest in all of that, not just to fall asleep, but really rest in it and to have, um, this, this deep sleep, this peacefulness, because he, he has this faith, he has this trust in what his father is going to do. And so we have to remember that when we are going through tough times, that Jesus isn't necessarily, he's not, he's not abandoning, abandoning us. He's not turning away from us but he's resting and he's waiting for us to recognize that we need him. We need to turn to him, that we need to call on him, that we need to ask for his, his guidance. And so the sleeping is not a bad thing. And it's sometimes we all have to rest ourselves in patience and waiting. And I think as we're getting ready to go into Advent, that's exactly what we all are ready to do. We're all getting ready to reflect. We're getting ready to prepare for the coming. So there may not be a storm right now waiting for the birth of Jesus, but there's this preparation. There's this buildup, if you will. And that's what happens in these storms. I mean, they intensify, they get, um, they get worse before they get better. And so 
while he is resting, he is waiting for that point to where it, it's kind of that breaking point of we need him. And so I, I want to explore um, our questions here for this chapter. And it says, when faced with a threatening situation, do you find yourself tending toward optimism or pessimism? How does this affect your spiritual life? Do you struggle to feel the presence of Jesus throughout the day? If so, can you think of anything you can do to remedy the situation? And I think there's just a beauty in saying that whispered prayer of Jesus, I trust in you. It's, it's almost to me like getting wrapped in a hug. You're, you know, he's there. It's that call to remind him like I, whether he's sleeping, whether he's, um, being a silent participant, um, you're reaffirming that you trust in him and that he's got you. And then number three, most of us are familiar with the experience of feeling that Jesus is asleep when we struggle with problems. Why do you think Jesus allows us to feel that way? And again, I, th I think we get so wrapped up in some of the worry, the anxiety, the fear, the trauma, the suffering, the grief, these things that overwhelm us, that he's waiting for us to realize that we have this tool. We have him in our arsenal. We have him in our weaponry to help us, to bring us back, to center us, to ground us in these storms. So uh, going into chapter four, does Jesus really care? And it says, they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care if we perish? And that's how we open this, this chapter up with Mark chapter four, verse 38. And we, again, kind of piggybacking off this last question, um, we will go through these storms, we'll go through these trials, and it's not that, that Jesus isn't there or he doesn't care. It's, he's waiting to make an impact because you have to think about, I think of it like I'm in the grocery store and my kids want a candy bar. And if I just say yes, every single time, it's just, it's an expectation. There's, there's this, um, undertone that's, that's there that it's just going to happen. It's going to be my way. I'm going to get what I want. And Jesus is sitting there and he is waiting and there's a lesson to be learned for us to call upon him and his timing is impeccable. We don't always realize it and we have to look for what he's trying to tell us. We have to be, um, open our eyes. We have to open our ears and we have to be receptive to it because if we're not, then it's just going to seem like abandonment and then it's just going to seem like we're, we're done. And, um, he's, he's not going to be there. And in reality, there's a purpose, there's a method to his madness. And I'm so glad that they drew upon, um, the resurrection of Lazarus in this chapter and how much it would fall flat if he had rushed to Lazarus the minute he found out he was sick. I mean, there was a whole there was a whole purpose and we see that now we see this story as it's unfolded, but at the time they didn't know this. And there was, there was beauty to this resurrection and this, um, this saving grace. And we come back to Martha and Mary. And I know you all, um, these two have been a reoccurring theme for us a lot this year. And so again, I think there's, there's more to the message. I think there's even more that we all can pay attention to with Martha and Mary. Um, but Martha, she's got this anxiety and, you know, this frustration and all of these things. And instead of asking Jesus for help, she starts telling him what she needs. And we all know how that goes. When we start our prayers with, well, God, if you would just give me this, and if you would just do this for me, this would make this aspect of my life so much better. Or I would be able to handle this. It's not our, our place. We can ask. We can absolutely ask, but what we need to be asking is to be led. And what is the purpose? What is the plan? What is the path? Help me 
see this, help this be revealed to me rather than I want and I need and I need you to do this for me. And when we start getting into that mentality, it becomes more about us rather than Jesus. And we have to be Jesus focused. We have to be other centered. And so that's so much easier said than done. And I know you all know what I'm talking about because I'm even saying this right now and I'm already recognizing things recently that I've just been saying, well, Jesus, can you just do this for me? Can you just make this happen? Because I'll just be so much lighter and I'll be happier. And I know I'm having a lesson of patience right now. And so we just have to continue to call upon our faith. We have to trust in this plan and let things play out. And that's very hard for us with our human nature. And Gary talks about Jesus struggled with temptation. Now he still was, was untouched. He wasn't a, a sinner, but um, he was still faced with, I mean, think about the 40 days in the desert and the devil coming to tempt him on a regular basis. I mean, so he, he walks this path with us. He knows what some of these struggles are. I mean, hello, he felt pain. He felt agony. He felt betrayal. He felt lost. I mean, all of these human, very real and raw and tangible feelings that we all go through every day. And so we have to put that back in the forefront of our minds. And we have to remember, we have to trust, we have to have faith that he is going to carry us through it may not always be the way that we want it. It may not always be with the response um, that we had asked for. But the beauty is we have to look for that underlying message. And I'm going to leave you at this before we go through these last few um, reflection questions at the end of this chapter. But um, for those of you who are in our parish, if you remember during Lent earlier this year, Father kept challenging us to go deeper. He kept telling us, Stop staying at your faith level right here, but challenging us to go deeper. Well, that's exactly what we need to challenge ourselves to do in these situations. When we don't quite understand, we recognize that God has put us on a path of something. We've been praying for something. Um, we've been looking for something. We need to pray for that deeper meaning, for that recognition of why the answer is is there for us maybe different than what we had hoped and asking for that recognition, but then also giving that uh, moment of thanksgiving because we may not be to that final result yet, but we have to know that he's, he's leading us down um, the right path for, for us. So um, for chapter four, does Jesus really care? Our reflection questions. When was the last time you turned to Jesus for help with your problems? Discuss the downside of being too fast or too slow with your request for help. Number two, do, do you sometimes feel that Jesus doesn't care about you? What triggers this feeling and how do you deal with it? Number three, the apostles made it clear how they felt about Jesus. Are you sometimes afraid to tell him your true feelings? If so, how does that reluctance affect your relationship with him? So really think about that tonight. And I love this prayer um, at the end of chapter four and at the end it says please wake up so have a great evening everybody and I will be talking to you tomorrow